Today we're going to figure out how to mount this spindle on that mill. So stick around. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Well, today we are finally getting back to the CNC mill, specifically the project of replacing the spindle that came on the mill with a new three horsepower ATC spindle that I picked up a couple of months ago now. We got as far as wiring up the VFD and getting the spindle running before taking a COVID break. And I spent a few weeks producing PPE for local hospitals here in Idaho. That project is done. And so now we're back to working on the mill. Now I have a general game plan for how I want to mount the spindle onto the column, but I don't have the details worked out. To do that, we need to pull the head off of the mill and take some measurements. Okay, let's talk about the game plan here. Uh, let me move the head down where you can see it better. And let me get this quill handle out of the way. I don't really want to mark this up. Let's try the smooth jaw pliers. There we go. Okay, the way the head works on this mill is you've got the main head casting here, and this is a cast iron piece. And this has got the gear train in it. The motor is up on top, and so it drives down into a gear train. This is the high and low speed selector, which shifts gears in here. Those come forward and drive the quill. And then there's a seam right here where the head attaches to the Z-axis uh, slide here. And this slide goes up and down on the uh, dovetail ways driven by, in my case, a ball screw, in the case of the original mill, a, uh, an Acme lead screw in the back here. And there's a pivot joint just about behind where this little hole is that allows the whole head to tilt left and right. And there's uh, you know some uh, geometry on the slide and four bolts that hold the head to this and allow it to pivot. And I want to continue to use that. So my plan is to take out those bolts and separate the head and then make basically an aluminum box frame that fits into the same geometry on the slide but accepts the new spindle on the front. So the first thing we need to do is get the head off of the mill. Okay, if I'm gonna take this off, I need some place to put it. This is relatively heavy, especially with the motor on. I don't wanna heft the whole thing off, so I'm gonna use the vise and the actual slides on the machine to take the weight and carry this off. And so I made a wooden platform to go on here. And this is just a piece of three quarter inch plywood screwed down to a two by four that I can then put in the mill vise. Clamp this in, and then that gives me a platform that I can set the head on. And just to make sure I don't make a mess of this, I'm gonna take a paper towel and stuff that up in the R8 taper in the spindle, just to make sure I don't get any debris in there. So the plan is to rotate the head to the side, and to do that, I need to loosen the bolts under here. Once this bottom one's loose, the head's able to rotate. Now, um, the head rotates on here once all of these bolts are free, but this hole is important. There's actually a set screw with a point that goes into a groove on the, um, the protrusion on the front of the slide here. And so the set screw will have to come out of that or the head will not come off the mill. So I'm just going to rotate this down. Make sure I've got enough clearance for that. And for the moment, I'm going to retighten this so it'll stay there. And then I'm going to reposition this underneath it in order to catch it. Okay, right about there. Now we should be able Take off all of these nuts. Okay. 
And then there's a shoulder bolt in the middle. That's the main pivot bolt. Oh, it's not a shoulder bolt. Okay, so now the head is loose, but it won't pull off because of this set screw. Okay, and that's just a set screw with a cylindrical point on it. And so now we should be free. What I don't know is how heavy that motor is. Is that gonna make it fall off? And that is very front heavy. Let me uh, find something to prop that up with. Okay, that'll sit on those blocks. Okay, so we can see the three bolts that are in there and the center, and then if I turn this around, we should be able to see the geometry inside the headstock. Okay, so inside the back here, you can see we've got these three holes. And, oh, there's a very sharp point down there. There's a little uh, stylus that sticks out to read on the uh, angle gauge here. There's a little readout of the degrees. And then these are captured T-bolts that come out the back if you take this off. And then these are the two screws that attach the slide to the uh, Z lead screw. So... So we can run that up and down, and what I need is to measure the geometry of this part and the diameter of this hole and the spacing of these and size of these bolt holes so that I can mill identical geometry onto the new part. In fact, what I really need is just the geometry of this. So let me get some measuring tools. Okay, that fits in those two. That's a 462. Oh yeah, it just fits in there. Let me grab a 461. And then let me take the measurement across those. And it looks like I'm gonna have to pull out the three to four inch micrometer. This will be the first time I've actually used this. Okay, it looks like we've got Three point oh five six inches. And just as a complete sanity check. Yep, yeah, three point oh five five and a half. Okay, and let me take a couple of the other measurements here and just make sure we've got basically the same thing. And this is 3.049. And let's take the other one. And we'll just average these and assume it's evenly spaced. And that looks like 3.053, so right in the middle of those two. Okay, now we need to know the diameter of that hole. For that, I'll pull out a bore gauge here. And this is not super critical, but we might as well match it as closely as we can. That's 1.973 inches. Let me do that again, just take another measurement at a different angle. And that's 1.971. And then I also need to know the depth, and the bottom of that's pretty rough, so I think I'm probably just fine with a caliper depth rod measurement. 
and that would be seven seventy nine. Seven eighty nine. Seven eighty one. Seven ninety three. Okay, so I'm going to call that. Say if we put that at seven ninety, we should be fine. Let me check and see how deep it is on this side, how long the pin is, just to make sure it's not a critical dimension. Yeah, six seventy nine on the depth there, so that should be just fine. And then I think we will want to locate that pin at about the same position off of the back. We'll want to put in a similar screw hole in the new part. Okay, we'll call that 198 for the pin. And the distance off of the back of this. We will call 232. Okay, is there anything else we need to know? I don't think so. I think everything else I was able to measure without taking this off. So I think we should be good to go. These are the dimensions we need. Got this diagram ready to go, and I know it's messy, but I can translate this into something neater in the computer. And then of course, I already put the spindle on the surface plate and diagrammed it up, and so I have all the dimensions of this, and I've already made a model for the spindle in Fusion 360. So with the model for the spindle and the dimensions here for the back plate, we should be all ready to design the uh, design the mount for the new spindle. This is a model of the spindle that I did in Fusion 360 and to make this model I just laid the spindle flat on my surface plate and used a height gauge to measure all of the vertical dimensions off of the baseline, measured all the diameters with calipers and then of course did the math to subtract from the height of the cylinder uh, the diameter or the radius of the cylinder in order to figure out how high the spindle bore was off of the table and everything else is just systematically measured and then modeled up in fusion and then carefully checked by checking the overall dimension to make sure it matches the most critical thing on here of course is the bolt hole pattern and I think I have this correct I put gauge pins in the holes and measured across them and measured two or three times to make sure that I had it uh, because that's the place where it's going to be really sensitive uh, when we actually go to mount this thing on the mill. These holes are for 5 16 or 8 millimeter machine screws and they are extremely tight. And in fact, the, there's very little clearance here for the head of the screw. You have to use uh, socket head cap screws or there's just no way they'll fit. I can always turn the heads down if I have to, but normal socket head cap screws in 5 16 18 will fit. So that's what I'm planning to use. Oh, and if you've noticed that my navigation here in Fusion 360 is a lot smoother than it has been in previous videos, I did actually pick up a Space Mouse uh, navigator control so I can just grab it and twist the knob and manipulate the model. That was a suggestion from somebody in a previous video. And I did a little bit of reading and picked one up and I absolutely love it. Okay, so that's the spindle. What we have to match it to is the Z slide. And I've just done a rough model of this. And I did this particular model before I pulled the head off of the mill. I knew kind of what was back there because I looked at photographs of teardowns of the mill. And there were a couple photographs that were head on. And so I was able to uh, take the photo and then dimension it and actually measure with calipers across a print or across the photo on the screen and scale that based on the dimensions here. And we will now go compare that to the measurements I just took off the actual part and we will see how close I got. So the main dimension of this thing is controlled with this sketch. And the key thing here is the height off of the baseline of this center and the uh, size and distance between the bolt holes that we need for the bolt circle. Now I went back and measured this and this height, the height of the center, I have it here dimensioned to the height of the bottom bolt 
because that's what I was able to measure before I took the head off. And so uh, let's go ahead and throw a dimension on here to the center and see how close we are. I happen to know that it's exactly four inches and it looks like by measuring to the bottom, I got that at 4.038. I'll go ahead and kill this dimension and dimension it up with that. So that was pretty close. Okay, and we know from putting pins in the holes that this dimension, this 394 is 10 millimeters that was taken off of the uh, bolt that I could measure. I now know that that hole is about 462 thousandths. So I'll change that to 0.462 inches. That's a little bit larger. And then the distance between these holes, we know that averaged, I'm looking here, 3053, 3056, 3049. So that's gonna be 3.053 minus the diameter of one of the pins, which we know was this. And that gives us a finished dimension of 2.591. Just doing the math in my head. Yeah, that seems reasonable. And that looks reasonable. Okay, so we have that dimensioned up correctly. Okay, and then the other thing that's important is the diameter of the center boss. Now, I don't really care about this, the diameter of this boss. I really care about the diameter of the hole that we're gonna make. And I'm just gonna go ahead and make those the same. So let's see what dimension we have on that. The dimension we have on that is 1.972. And what I measured, I measured in two places. I measured 1.971 and 1.973. So that uh, 1.972 is going to be exactly right. And uh, to be clear, I estimated that by measuring off of a photograph I found on somebody's website showing their teardown. So I feel really good about that. And then we know that the depth of the hole is going to need to be 790 thousandths. How far did I model this pin? I modeled the pin length at 750, and it's, it's, it's between 740 and 750, depending on exactly where you measure it. So, okay, I'm happy with that. Go ahead and save that. And let's bring up the model of the whole assembly. So this is how I'm planning to mount it. We've got the slide here in the back, and then if I turn off that slide, you can see that the back piece here is a plate of aluminum that's got a recess in the back to take that pin and it's got holes for the three bolts to hold it on and a hole in the center so we'll use the same studs that are used to mount the original spindle on and the one bolt through the center and that will hold this back plate on and then that back plate is connected by countersunk and recessed uh, socket cap screws to two side plates a top plate that boxes this in and makes it rigid. And then the spindle is just bolted into the front edge of those two side plates. So we get a rigid box that's closed on five of the six sides. It would be possible to close off the bottom, but that's gonna start to cause problems with access to the mounting bolts. And I think it's gonna be plenty rigid because the way this is all set up in order to force the bottom edges of this box out of parallel to force this to parallelogram, you're gonna have to actually force one or more of these other sides to parallelogram. And the aluminum should be very strong in compression in that direction. So I don't anticipate this being a big deal. If it is, these parts could, you know, if I end up with a lot of chatter or flex, which again, I'm not anticipating, it would be possible to make these out of something like um, gray cast iron, uh, or ductile iron, you know, something that's gonna be really rigid, but I, I don't think it's going to be necessary. Steel's also a possibility. The only thing I'm a little bit worried about making these side plates out of aluminum is that the screws here, the, the 5 16 18 machine screws that hold the spindle on, and then of course the parallel screws that hold the load to this back plate, those are gonna be threaded into aluminum. And so if that ends up being a problem in the long run, I can remake the side pieces out of steel. I could put thread inserts in the side pieces, or I could even bore out the side pieces and put a steel rod through with threads in each end just to take the compression, just like a single nut that goes all the way through. 
I don't think any of that is going to be necessary. I think this is going to work. So let's uh, go ahead and reload our modified slide and update the dimensions here. And then let's make sure all that stuff came across. Okay, and the distance between these holes we decided was supposed to be 2.591. Let me make sure that's actually the case here. 2.591, yep, okay, so that dimension came across. We need to check the outer dimension of this hole and the diameter that is 1.972. So that came across correctly. And then what is the depth of this pocket? Depth of that pocket is seven, 750 thousandths, that's three quarters of an inch. And we actually need that to be 790. So let's go find that feature. If you just click on the surface created by that feature, you'll see these three little lines that are above this extrusion. That means that extrusion was the feature that created that surface. So I'll double click on that to edit. Instead of minus 0.75, I'll make that 0.79. Just go just a little bit deeper. And that will give us that pocket. Okay, so I think that is all the geometry we need. And so we just need to make some drawings and then machine some parts. Of course, to actually mill the parts, I need a mill, which means I've got to put the old head back on and tram it back in, which on these little mills is honestly really a pain. I was really hoping to avoid it, but due to the COVID-19 situation, this is the only mill that I currently have access to. So unless I want to make the parts on the lathe, this is my only path forward. So I will put this all back together off camera, and next time we will start on machining the parts. If you're enjoying these videos, please give me a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe to the channel, and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.